Hello and welcome to our Q4 2023 webcast. I'm Netta Mikkila. We have an exciting agenda for today's webcast. We'll be discussing the three following topics, a sustainability overview for 2023, key reminders and the geopolitical environment and their accounting impacts. I am very delighted to be co-presenting with my colleagues in the Global Corporate Reporting Services, David Clement, Andreas Hall, and Gary Bershowitz. We hope you enjoy the webcast. Thanks, Netta. And uh, I guess moving on now, let's maybe talk about sustainability, climate issues, how they're affecting specifically sustainability reporting. But then I think we'll also have a look at how they're affecting financial statements. So, Andreas, over to you to tell us how sustainability reporting is coming along. Okay. Just a few things going on, Gary, right now. So, I mean, maybe just to briefly summarize, because I know we have a lot of thought leadership and the like out there on the subjects. We don't have to go through every gory detail, but broadly, there's sort of, I'll call it three frameworks out there that many companies will get caught by because the way sustainability reporting is being teed up right now is it's often your reporting obligation is driven by where you do business as opposed to where you're headquartered and where your shares are listed. So many multinational companies will have to report potentially under multiple frameworks. And so we'll talk about the three that are most likely to catch a multinational in this uh, in this session. And so those three are, we have the EU standards, so CSRD, which will affect any company of any meaningful size that operates in, in Europe. We have um, the ISSB, so the International Baseline, put out by the sister board of the IASB, which a number of countries outside of Europe are either have adopted, like Brazil, or a number of countries are contemplating adopting that and requiring it for their local reporting. And then we have the rules in the U.S., whether it's coming from the federal government, so the Securities Exchange Commission, or potentially some of the large states like California that have passed their own laws that impose reporting requirements on companies doing business in their state. And I think one of the important things to remember here is doing business in many of these definitions is, is, is a very, very low threshold. So I think in California, doing business means you have $700,000 of revenue in California, which just about any multinational company is going to easily trip that, uh, mm -hmm. trip that criteria. So, What's happened this year is while we talked a lot about sustainability reporting last year this time, this year what's happened is that all these proposals have to a large extent turned into actual laws and regulations that are now um, in force. So the EU finalized the uh, CSRD and the uh, underlying reporting standards, ESRS, over the summer, and they've gone through the final legislative process in the last couple of months. Um, the ISSB released their standards S1 and S2 back in uh, back in June, and they've issued some additional guidance um, since then. So the update to the SASB standards um, is going final sort of any day now. Um, yeah. And then the while well, the SEC proposal remains a proposal, um, the state of California, which is the largest state in the U.S., and people who live there always remind me it's the fifth largest economy in the world. So even though it's only a state, it is a fairly large. Pretty big entity from an economic perspective has enacted a number of laws that impose climate reporting obligations on companies doing business there. And the interesting thing is that those rules will actually catch a larger number of companies than the SEC proposal would because it goes well beyond companies that are headquartered and listed in the U.S. So, um, and remind me, Andreas, sorry, I know, I know we've talked about it before and maybe we've got a document, but um, have we, has someone done an analysis to say, if you comply with one of these, how, how much overlap is, how much extra work do I have to do? And sorry, I know we, I know we talked yes. about it before, and if that's a five, five no, hour conversation. No, we, we have published some documents that compare these. And I think the important thing to remember is that there are a lot of commonalities between them. There, there's certainly some differences. So the California laws focus only on climate. Mm -hmm. Um, ISSB and the EU um, regulations focus on sustainability more broadly. Um, so there's a little bit of a difference in scope, but as it relates to the climate reporting, there's a high level of um, consistency amongst the climate standard in ISSB, the California law, the SEC proposal, and the um, frankly what the UK is doing, yeah. and um, and what's being required in uh, in Europe. I mean, there's always nuanced differences, but if a company wanted to comply broadly with the climate reporting requirements, yep. 
you can largely get there, right? And that is the holy grail to try to have one report that covers as many requirements as possible. Once you move beyond climate, it gets a little bit more, um, a little bit more challenging, mm -hmm. and uh, that's sort of I'll call it outside of the scope of this. But that yeah, is, yeah, yeah. you know, one of the critical objectives is to try to find a way to get the highest degree of alignment uh, possible. Yeah. So, so that's the first thing is that we've gone from proposals to things that are actually um, now in place. And so now the question is like, when does this, does this actually become effective? Um, so that really depends on mm. what you're scoped into. Um, most of these regulations have a phased in um, effective date. And so the largest preparers get caught first. Mm -hmm. So the largest EU preparers, so companies that are listed on public exchanges in the EU, yeah. um, they're affected in one month, right, is when the reporting obligation starts. So for calendar 2024. Um, the SEC, we don't know yet because it's still a proposal. California, um, the requirements, it's not 100% clear, but it looks like the earliest ones are going to be in 2025. Um, and then, uh, you know, ISSB is a function of what the individual jurisdiction that mandates ISSB reporting uh, requires. Yep. So I think Brazil, which is the first country that has required it, it's going to be voluntary for two years and then mandatory, I think, in 2026. But so there is a bit of a confusing chart we have to help people navigate when yeah, they yeah, might. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> so unfortunately, the dates don't line up amongst the various uh, jurisdictions. And some of that is just, you know, they're in various different timelines in terms of their uh, legislative uh, process. But, but I guess I, if I heard you right, then if I try and really summarize that, it sounds like if, I'm, if I've got operations in Europe and I'm one of these bigger entities that's going to be caught, you, that's who's going first. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So basically, if you're listed on a you know stock exchange or have publicly traded debt in Europe, most likely you're effective with reporting that starts in a few weeks' time. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then if you're in the next tier, so you're not publicly traded, but you have a large operation there, so you're a multinational that has large subsidiaries in Europe, and large is not necessarily that large, um, then your reporting is you know a few years later, but because of the <clears throat> because of the comp complexity of this reporting, that doesn't mean you can ignore this for the next okay. couple of uh, years. There's still a lot of groundwork to be done, including you know, most companies that are in scope have some level of sustainability reporting already. And so, you know, one of the questions will just be, you know, how do you take what I'm doing currently yeah. and start moving it in the direction of what will be required? You know, yeah. that's sort of the transition from voluntary to mandatory. You want to start thinking about that now, even if your reporting isn't mandatory until a year or two or yeah. three from now. Like you want to start thinking about that uh, transition um, now. So, so that's the, we have standards, we have effective dates, and then it's a question of where is it going to be effective. And so the other thing that's happening right now is that more and more jurisdictions are going through their legislative or regulatory process to say, yes, we are going to have requirements. And I think every major territory within the next two years is going to have a reporting requirement of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there, there will be phase-ins most likely based on what we're seeing right now. Um, but I think with each passing month, you're going to see more announcements that country A has decided they're going to adopt this set of standards and, you know, and here will be the effective dates and here's who will be scoped in. Yep. Some countries are doing the, it's only going to apply to domestic companies and others are writing the rules more based on a where you do business, which is different than the financial reporting world where yep. we're used yep. to it more being driven by where you're listed or where you're headquartered. So that is a... Uh, that is a bit of a nuance that is you know, something new we have to contend with. And then, yes, the big question is, um, now that we have all the details, to what extent can you reconcile them? And uh, you know, we're now moving into something that we're more familiar with, with the financial reporting world, where the standard setters are going to start to issue interpretive guidance. So both the EU and the ISSB have set up interpretive bodies. So, you know, where you can send in questions and they will, Sounds a bit like they will answer them. Yeah, <laughs> similar to uh, what we're used to on the financial reporting side. But also um, the ISSB is about the, has just published some illustrative examples to help people understand how to apply a portion of the S1, you know, scoping algorithm because mm -hmm. it doesn't tell you 
that these are the things that are sustainability issues you have to discuss beyond climate, everything else. There's sort of a process you go through to identify what are the in-scope items, which is, again, a little different than accounting where we say there's an inventory standard. So if you yeah, have inventory, yeah, yeah. apply the inventory standard. Yep, this yep. is more, you have to figure out what is actually a sustainability risk or opportunity that's material enough to talk about. There's a process you go through to figure out what those are. So there's some, obviously, that's a very abstract process that we're not, quite so used to in the reporting world. Um, so uh, there's some interpretive guidance to help people understand, well, how do I actually go through that uh, go through that process? And there'll be much more coming, I think, in the next year or two in terms of helping companies to uh, figure out how to move from voluntary reporting to mandatory reporting that's in compliance with a specific set yep. of uh, yep. standards. So things we kind of take for granted in the financial reporting world, you know, we're building towards that in yeah. sustainability. Yeah. And I imagine we'll start getting more of those interpretative questions and guidance as people start putting pen to paper, you know, and the rubber hits the road and then people are like, wait a minute, this made sense when I was reading it theoretically, yeah. but now that I'm actually doing it, I've got a couple of questions. So I imagine there's going to be quite a bit more guidance that starts coming out when this stuff becomes effective. Yeah, well, because if you think about like voluntary reporting is you you go through some sort of a process internally to figure out what do I think is meaningful and that's what I reported Yeah. to now there's more of a, well, there needs to be a different robustness around that process. And it's a little less about what you think is meaningful mm -hmm. and a bit more about what do stakeholders think is meaningful. And those two filters don't necessarily yield the same output, right? And so... Uh, yeah. And so then once you're actually applying an algorithm, as opposed to just, here's what I think is important, you logically have questions on how does that work and how do I decide whether something is actually material, and particularly since different than financial reporting, we have this concept of material in the short, medium, and long term. So it's not just that it's material now, it might still be in scope if it's only material at some point in the out in the future, which yeah. maybe is a good segue to how this all connects to financial reporting, where we have a different view on materiality. It's much more of a now focus on materiality as opposed to the to the long term. It, it is, it is. But I think you're as you as you mentioned and as you know, you know, a lot of the sustainability issues and the reporting have made people question whether or not financial statements, so not sustainability reporting, but actual financial statements that we've been preparing and presenting for many, many years are actually providing the appropriate amount of disclosure and information and consideration as it relates to sustainability issues. And so folks may recall that in 2020, I think the ISB issued some educational material uh, in, in response to people saying, hey, how is this climate stuff built into financials? Why am I not seeing a whole lot of the disclosures that I think I should be seeing in financial statements? I think some of that Personally, I think it was a was a, a, a response from from stakeholders and investors saying they wanted sustainability information. They didn't at that time have sustainability reporting, yes. so they said maybe I can use the financials as a way to get some of this information. So I think I think some of the pressure came from that. So I think hopefully some of it will reduce after we start getting these sustainability standards you're talking about. But I do think, as I said, the ISP issued that educational material, and they they noted the different areas in the financials that should be subject to a consideration of climate and sustainability. And, you know, for example, your impairment calculations, your useful life calculations, your provisions. So, for example, I think you've used this example before. If I'm saying, you know, I have to transition my factory away from a certain type of location because I'm worried that it's going to be flooded in 10 years' time, I wouldn't expect the useful life of that PPE to still be 30 years because the stuff right. needs to be consistent. And so, I think that, you know, that there's, there's a whole list of things. And I think the ISP actually reissued that educational material this year in, you know, at the same time that the sustainability standards came out from an international perspective. So, so we have that in terms of saying these are the types of things you should be thinking about in your financial statements today um, from a sustainability or climate perspective. And I think you'll see that list is quite long, that there's mm. many standards within the accounting framework yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that I just are rattled potentially three. affected. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, maybe just to continue with your example, while in that case, like the life probably shouldn't be 30 years if, if the factory can't exist on that plot of land for more than 10, um, it's possible that that factory is not impaired because it's possible that the cash flows in the next 10 years are sufficient to support the current carrying value of the assets. So you might have to change the life. Maybe it's not impaired. 
But that doesn't mean that the company's not exposed to some significant climate risks that you still need to disclose. And maybe that disclosure does belong more in the uh, sustainability report rather than the financial statements, because you look at it and say, well, no, the asset is actually okay. Yes, there's something I have to do in the future, but that doesn't affect my financial position now. And so it's not a matter for the financial statements. It's more a matter for the um, for the sustainability report. And I think that that's the nuance that maybe sometimes is missed is that, yes, there's many things that are potentially affected. And yes, you have to think about that. Yeah. But it's possible you come out of the other side of that um, analysis and say, well, yeah, there's some a few things I need to um, mention or consider in the financial statements, but most of the effects are actually, uh, you know, in, in, in the future, and much of what's on the balance sheet is more oriented to today, right? Like most of your inventory yep, yep. is going to be sold within 10 years. Yep. So if something you know, very negative is going to happen in terms of affecting your business model 10 years from now, that likely doesn't affect your inventory now. Yep. Right. Yep. It might affect. Well, I think actually they might have actually even put inventory in there to say from an NRV perspective, you need to think of it as longer term if it'll be right. affected. But I think what you were saying there is a good segue actually probably to the next the next point we want it's made, which is this this uh, cohesiveness or consistency between what you might be thinking and saying in your sustainability reporting compared to what's in your financial statements. And I think this is an area that stakeholders and particular regulators are very, very focused on because they say it makes no sense if you, as you either voluntarily before, as you were just talking about now, as the requirements on sustainability reporting become more uh, defined and probably a little bit more um, expansive, people are going to say more stuff about their sustainability uh, uh, exposures and climate. And the key message here, if we're going to take one thing away, is you should be consistent in terms of what you're saying when you talk about your sustainability risks and exposures relative to what's in the financial statements. So carrying on with our example of the PPE, you know, it may be that the useful life gets shortened to 10 years because I said in my sustainability reports, this is happening in this place, I'm exposed to climate, this is what I think it's going to, is going to happen. But again, the point you made, I may not have an impairment, but I think the key point there is, it's not just the things you are saying, it's some of the things where I've assessed it, it's not gonna result in an impairment, but I think it's, it's important for companies to think about, do I need to actually specifically say that now in the financials, that someone reading the sustainability report is clearly gonna be asking that question, is there an impairment indicator or at least consideration? Sometimes it's helpful to say, we've considered the impact of Mm -hmm. this type of climate risk or sustainability risk and management has concluded that you know it's not a big deal for the following reasons. So I think normally in financials we just say when things have resulted in a change of measurement or recognition, okay. I think now the key message is you might have to add a little bit more in to the extent you might need to complete the story. Yep. And I think um, the, Euro the European Securities and Markets uh, Authority, ESMA, issued a really helpful document in October this year, which actually it's called the heat is on or something, climate disclosures. But I think what's really, what's really good about it is it, is, it, is it goes through and gives examples of disclosures that um, preparers have made to show that link between the sustainability uh, aspects and how they are disclosed in the financial statements. And I think some of the key principles that the report is talking about is that connectivity the cohesiveness, the consistency between what you're saying for sustainability reporting versus your financials. So I think that, you know, that's my key message. If there's anything people take away for this you know, year end when they're preparing their financials, it's whatever you're saying from a sustainability perspective, whether or not it's voluntary or you're caught by something that you're trying to get ahead of, make sure that your financials are consistent with what you're saying there. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the things maybe people should be aware of, particularly on climate, but I think this is going to happen with other sustainability matters over time, is one of the things that's happening in terms of change in reporting, in addition to this shift from voluntary to mandatory, one of the features of the mandatory reporting is it's not enough anymore to say that, yes, climate is out there, it's an issue, and it's going to impact my company. And yes, I'm going to set some target in the distant future to be in a better place. But more disclosure around, well, what are you going to tangibly do to get from here to that point where you actually meet that target? Mm -hmm. you know, are you going to redesign your product? Are you going to change your fundamentally change your supply chain? Are you going to um, you have to incur some real costs to buy credits or to buy new machinery that's more efficient or or purchase renewable power, which might, depending upon where you are, be more expensive? Wh whatever it is, like there's going to be more 
robust reporting about, I'll call it the what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And then that, of course, often will have cash flow impacts, which feeds into impairment models, but it also maybe affects your disclosures around uh, capital commitments and, and, and other things. And so, or provisions, which is a or, good segue I think, to the yes. next thing we wanted to talk about, which was, as people are saying all of that, Andreas, I think it's it's natural for people to go, well, you've, you've acknowledged you're going to do all of this stuff. You've created this expectation in the market, a constructive potentially expectation or constructive obligation. Where are the liabilities? And yeah. so, you know, as you know, the, the interpretations committee, the IPRS interpretations committee had a submission that came in and they discussed it in November, actually. So, and that was around provisions, IS-37 provisions, specifically related to net zero commitments. And so the question that came in that the committee got was, if someone has gone out there and said, I'm going to be net zero by 2029, this is my plan, it's going to result in me having to do all these things, buying new PPE or changing the way I, I, I buy my PPE, also maybe having to buy carbon credits to, to set off the emissions that I may not be able to, to offset naturally. Why is there no liability in the, in the financials today? And that was the question the committee got asked. They discussed it in November. The tentative agenda decision has just come out. Um, and I think the answer is there is no liability currently under IFRS <clears throat> in most cases for a couple of key reasons. I think the first is if my obligation is to swap cash for a new piece of kit or PPE or equipment that's going to produce the same products but in a more you know, uh, climate beneficial way, that is the exchange of one asset for another. There's no outflow of economic benefits. That's an exchange of economic benefits. That might be the one reason why you don't have a liability. Said differently, just in ordinary course, if I sign a purchase order to buy a piece of equipment, yeah. that's not a liability. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's, a, that's the one aspect. And the other one is, even if you think that come 2029, in my example, you're not going to have enough of change internally and you're going to have to actually buy those credits, the way the current standards the way IS-37 currently works, you need to have a past event. Even if you've created a, an expectation in the minds of people, a constructive uh, uh, obligation or constructive requirement, you can only have an obligating event when a past event has occurred. And I think the key, the key point that the committee came up with was to say the past event and that type of fact pattern is typically the day 2029 swings by and you now are at a point where you are not net zero. When that happens, you now have crystallized the commitment to make a payment. Until that happens, a past event hasn't occurred and therefore you wouldn't have a liability. So I think you know, it's a tentative agenda decision, but I think it's aligned with, with how we at least see it. And I think the, the, the messaging is in most cases, you won't have a liability for commitments that you've agreed to in the future. It doesn't mean business isn't gonna change. Right. It doesn't mean there's not gonna be cash outflows and you might need to consider potential impairment indications. But I think by and large, you generally won't have a liability. So we'll see what the comment letters come back to the committee. We at least, I think, agree broadly with where they were but let's watch that space. But I think there's more going on as well. So that's IFRS today, but Andreas, isn't there, aren't there some things going on the horizon in terms of what the, the board might be looking at? Yeah, so I think the, the board more generally has thought about, uh, you know, should more information about climate change be in the financials and then maybe even broader than that, are there other business risks that they more explicitly need to, uh, to, to think about? So we have IAS-1, which does have some language in there, right, that says that business risks, you know, to the extent that they may impact the future cash flows of the business, paraphrasing here, right, that, that there's some disclosure requirement um, around that. And, you know, you do see that some companies do say something about climate. It tends to be the ones that are most acutely affected that have already have some language, but very few companies have that. Um, some of that may be that, um, you know, a lot of the commitments are 2030 and mm -hmm. we're still in 2023. So you still have some time to figure out exactly what is it that I'm going to do to uh, reach those, um, those, those targets or those commitments. And, you know, maybe there's only so much you can say until that crystallizes. But as we get closer, that's going to become um, more apparent. But I think it's become clear that virtually every company is affected by climate change to some degree. And it's not just a small number. And so that uh, maybe this is a little different than just business risks in general that you know affect some industries and not others. Or, and so um, you know, the, the board is looking at this issue to say, well, do we need some enhanced guidance to help people better determine when and what it is you need to uh, say to uh, you know, make sure that you have uh, you know, a robust picture of what the company is uh, exposed to. It's not explicitly captured 
yet by yes. things like going concerns that doesn't look forward enough and you know, maybe asset impairments in certain industries you know you if you really are at risk that in time you'll have more robust disclosures but if your effects are say on unrecognized assets or things like that it's far less clear what you need to say today under the current standards and so i think uh you know the board has acknowledged that they need to give this some more thought and see if some additional authoritative guides as opposed to the educational materials that they've published so far would be uh, would be would be useful yeah yeah i guess on a personal note i'm <clears throat> i'm relatively uh, supportive of this one i think you know if you think financial statements are supposed to be relevant and we want yes. to remain relevant i think expanding the the ambit of, of disclosures around these are the things that the company could affect the financial position and performance of the company moving forward. Not an MDNA, but things that are existing in the, in the yes. balance sheet and income statement today. I think users will find that pretty relevant. And if you think about it, that's the product that the ISP is ultimately trying to produce for people. So we'll watch the space, I guess, but uh, I'm, I'm quite, uh, quite interested to see where the board gets to on that one. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think, you know, look, there's, it's not an accident that the ISSB and the IASB are under the same umbrella. And in theory, what you're trying to do is provide a complete package of relevant information to the investor community, right? That that's ultimately the charter. And so you do want to make sure that sort of where the financial statements end, sustainability reporting begins. And yes, maybe there's a little bit of overlap, but you do want to make sure that sort of, I'll call it IAS1 goes far enough that um, there isn't a gap between the uh, the two. And I think that's probably all the board, and I assume they're going to be talking to their sister board about this as well to make sure that borderline is well well defined and nothing. Thanks, Andreas. It was a good chat. Obviously, lots of exciting stuff coming down the pipe from a sustainability perspective. So we'll watch that space. And um, I guess over to you, Ned, to take us through some year-end reminders. So, now we go to our reminder section, and our first reminder relates to the OECD Pillar 2 model rules, which is intended to establish the global minimum tax rate of 15% for large multinational enterprises. The situation is still evolving with different jurisdictions adopting the Pillar 2 rules at different rates, and also coming up with their own qualifying domestic minimum taxes to prevent leakage out of their country. So as a reminder, the ISP issued narrow scope amendments to IS-12 to introduce an exception to recognizing and disclosing information about different taxes related to Pillar 2. The amendments also require additional disclosures on an entity's exposure to Pillar 2 taxes for periods between when the Pillar 2 rules are substantively enacted and before the rules are effective. These new requirements are applicable to entities with annual reporting periods ending 31 December 2023. So please take note of them when preparing your financial statements for the year. We have a useful in-depth publication online on the accounting impact of Pillar 2 that people can also refer to. And we also just did a separate IFRS Talks podcast focusing on Pillar 2, where we go through an overview of the tax rules practical challenges, safe harbors, and related accounting implications. We hope that these will be useful resources for people dealing with the impact of Pillar 2 on financial reporting for this 31 December year ends. Other than the direct impact of the IS-12 amendments, entities should also consider the related implications of Pillar 2 on other aspects of business and financial reporting. Firstly, due to the complexity of the Pillar 2 tax computation rules and volume of potentially new data points, entities may need to relook at their processes and systems to make sure that they are sufficiently prepared for Pillar 2, both from a tax compliance perspective and a financial reporting perspective. This could be difficult, especially when a multinational enterprise has subsidiaries in many different countries or where entities around the group may be using various different accounting systems. Uh, there are also other accounting consequences that companies need to be aware of. For example, the cash flow impact of top-up taxes will need to be carefully considered in determining the recoverable amount of a cash generating unit for impairment testing purposes. In a value news calculation, there should theoretically not be a significant impact to the VIU calculated on a post-tax basis versus a pre-tax basis. 
However, on the other hand, when calculating the fair value less cost to sell of the CGU, we would need to determine which CGU's cash flows will be impacted by the top up taxes. Is it in the CGU that is liable for the tax payment? or the entity in a low tax jurisdiction that triggered the top-up tax. Currently, views are tending towards including the tax consequence in the entity that triggered the top-up tax. The follow-up question to that is, which entity should record the tax expense in their separate financial statements? Is it the entity that is liable for the tax payment, or should it be imputed in the entity that triggered the top-up tax? The jury is still out on these issues, so watch the space for the guidance that we put out when they are concluded. Another thing that multinational entities may want to think about would be in relation to the overall organization of the business and whether the benefits from operating in low tax jurisdictions would still outweigh the costs from the additional top up tax and other compliance activities. In order to help companies on this journey, we do have a Pillar 2 readiness website where you can find resources such as our data input catalog, which provides a guide to the data companies need to collect in preparation for the Pillar 2 requirements. And also our country tracker, which provides the status of Pillar 2 implementation in different jurisdictions. Finally, if you have any questions about Pillar 2 tax rules or their related accounting implications, do reach out to your PwC contact for support. Now we go to things not to miss. I think it's often easier to review and audit accounting entries that have been posted. That is the existence assertion. Rather than identifying entries that should have been posted but were not, which is the completeness assertion. I think the challenging bit for preparers as well as auditors is to connect the dots, to understand the business and transactions in totality, and with that, connected mindset, finding the things that are not obvious or posted, but that should have been journaled into the books and records. This year, we have compiled a list of items not to miss as companies and auditors are heading into the year end. We have published a document uh, in depth on items you cannot see, which is now available on Viewpoint. So here are a few examples of key items not to miss. I think there might be others depending on the company and the industry, but this is a very good starting point. First one is liabilities for financial guarantees. After the change from IFRS 4 style accounting for financial guarantees, IFRS 9 or 17 now require many entities that previously applied an IFRS 4 liability adequacy test consistent with IS-37 principles to now recognize a liability for the first time. This could be a significant change in accounting policy that would need to be applied retrospectively. Onerous contracts. An onerous contract is a contract in which the unavoidable costs of meeting the obligations under the contract exceed the economic benefits expected to be received. At the moment, particularly, the uncertainty in the economic environment may impact an entity's operations and result in an increased number of onerous contracts. For example, costs to deliver on existing revenue contracts may rise due to inflationary pressures, or in other examples, benefits expected from existing purchase contracts may fall due to lower demand, making it difficult to resell committed purchases at a profit. Provisions may now need to be recognized for historically that may not have been the case. Restoration provisions. Site restoration provisions should be made in respect of the estimated future costs of closure and restoration. Often leases allow the tenant to improve the property by adding additional partitioning, but they include obligations on the lessee to return the property at the end of the lease in its original condition. This might entail dismantling the improvements. Entities may have argued that options to renew the lease would be taken. But if there is a change in circumstances such that, for example, leases will no longer be renewed, dismantling outflows may now materialize quicker than expected and perhaps become material for the first time so that the provision would need to be recognized. Share buyback liabilities. 
Often, entities place contracts with brokers or banks to acquire their own shares on their behalf. Contracts containing an obligation for an entity to purchase its own equity instruments for cash or another financial asset give rise to a financial liability. Unconsolidated SPVs. Some entities have been designed so that voting or similar rights are not the dominant factor in deciding who controls them. They may run on autopilot. None of the parties involved in the setup may appear to have power, but entities may be indirectly controlled by one of the parties involved, and this could lead to consolidation requirements. When assessing whether a structured entity should be consolidated, one needs to consider the control criterion, which requires investor to have the power to direct the relevant activities of the structured entity so as to obtain benefits. A key consideration in assessing the design and purpose of such a structured entity and whether the investor has exposure to the risks and rewards of the structured entity. Additionally, careful consideration of the rights of other parties involved and determination of whether the investor has decision-making rights over the activities of the structured entity is needed. Implied leases. Some arrangement may be entered into that do not take the legal form of a lease, but they still convey rights to use identifiable assets in return for a payment or series of payments. Examples of such arrangements include service contracts with dedicated equipment, outsourcing arrangements, or, for example, telecommunication contracts that provide rights to capacity over identifiable assets. Such assets may not be mentioned in the contract, but perhaps are implicitly specified when the supplier makes it available to the customer, and that therefore the contract may fall under the IFR 16 guidance. So we move on to hyperinflationary economics. The IMF World Economic Outlook report released in October 2023 provides updated data in respect of current and protected levels of inflation. The most significant changes from the updates provided in, in April 2023 relate to Ghana and Sierra Leone, which are considered to be hyperinflationary from 31 December 2023. Haiti was considered to be hyperinflationary economy from 31 March 2023. Entities with the currency of Yemen as their functional currency should continue to apply IS-29 for reporting periods ending 31 December 2023, but they should monitor the rates of inflation over the next year. Due to a lack of reliable local data, it is difficult to, ex to assess the exact point at which Yemen has fallen or will fall below the 100% threshold and should therefore no longer be subject to hyperinflation. Entities with the currency of South Sudan as their functional currency will no longer be hyperinflationary in 2023, and they should stop applying IS-29 in December 2023. However, entities should consider any significant events or conditions that might contradict this conclusion between now and the end of 2023. The rest of the economies that were hyperinflationary in 2022 to continue to be hyperinflationary in 2023. New entities in the list of entities in the watch list, Egypt, Malawi, Nigeria, and Pakistan. And to the list of lack of reliable data, we have added Eritrea, Kuwait, and Syrian Arab Republic. Entities with currency of these countries should consider the information available at the reporting date to determine whether IS-29 is applicable. So let me take it uh, from here. The time flies and the new standard for entrance uh, contracts, so IFRS 17, is finally, uh, after more than 20 years of hard labor, uh, effective. So th this marks a, a huge milestone for the insurance industry who's been, I guess, working so hard to make this uh, project come to fruition. But, and that's the message here, uh, it's not just traditional insurers that need to pay attention to uh, IFRS 17. So IFRS 17 applies to contracts, that's the key to contracts, that meet the definition of insurance contract in the standard. 
regardless of uh, whether the contract is labeled as, as an insurance contract. And more importantly, regardless of the entity that issues them. So forgive the double negative here, but not being a regulated insurance business does not scope you out of uh, IFRS 17. So, so while the insurance contract definition in IFRS 17 is substantially unchanged from the previous standard, that is IFRS 4, the accounting consequences of IFRS 17 are very different. So IFRS 17 has a specific and often complex recognition and measurement requirements. So this is in contrast to IFRS 4, which essentially allowed companies to continue using their previous gap for insurance contract, which included a, a wide variety of measurement approaches, including approaches similar to other standards such as IS 37. But there is good news. So the good news is that IFRS 17 provides explicit scope uh, exceptions for some types of agreements typically issued by uh, non-insurance companies that could otherwise uh, meet the definition of an insurance contract. So examples include uh, some products or, or service warranties and some uh, fixed fee uh, service contracts. So the key message here is for all companies to have a good understanding of what an insurance contract is and what are the scope exceptions to take you out of it. So for the year end, so do not forget to review one last time if some of your contracts may actually be in scope of IFR 17. So remember when Netta alluded earlier to the completeness assertion. And of course, uh, remain on the lookout for new features uh, finding their way in your commercial agreements that may turn out to create a significant insurance, insurance risks uh, for your organization. So that includes you know, keeping an awareness, developing an awareness in the organization for what an insurance contract is and you know, to be ready to account for them uh, if, if needs be. So to learn more about the IFRS 17 scope, so take a read of our in-depth uh, IFRS 17 affects more than just insurance companies. Next topic is uh, disclosure. So uh, last but not least, uh, another helpful reminder for entities when uh, thinking ahead about their year-end reporting is not to forget uh, about disclosures. In times of complexity and uncertainty, uh, disclosures in the financial statements take a key role and should not be left for the very end. So proper thinking and data gathering is, is needed to tell a possibly complicated story in a concise, clear, and effective uh, manner. So challenging economic conditions, such as uh, what we're going through as a rising inflation, interest rates, and uncertainty on political situations, may trigger the, may trigger the need for entities to adapt uh, their disclosures to the current environment, uh, notably around so the binary judgments made uh, as part of applying an accounting policy, uh, higher uh, quantitative estimation uncertainty for both short and, short and long duration uh, assets and liabilities, and, sensit uh, and sensitivity analysis over the assumptions used in various estimates, including uh, updating the reasonably possible change that underlie the uh, sensitivity analysis. So IS-1 requires uh, disclosures about judgments that have a significant effect on the financial statements, as well as sources of uh, significant estimation uncertainty. So in, in this uncertain environment, these disclosures may uh, be even more important and, and delicate to convey the right message. So please refer to our in-depth on navigating IFRS accounting standards, though the current uh, trademark. In, in the periods of rising inflation and interest rates uh, for more guidance. Another thing to consider is that when facing uh, challenging economic situations, entities may use various financing structures you know, to, to meet their, their financing needs, such as, for example, uh, supplier finance arrangements, which were the topic of recent uh, normative developments. So although these, uh, these amendments to add specific disclosure requirements for these arrangements are not mandatorily effective for this year end. Entities uh, would still need to address the existing disclosure requirements in IFRS accounting standards, mainly uh, under IS1. So in our published uh, in-depth on this topic, uh, we link to the material issued by the IFRIC, 
uh, which was the first one to address uh, this topic before the ISB uh, picked up the project, where a summary of the current requirements is, is set out. And on this, I pass it on to Gary. Right, our fourth agenda item, geopolitical uh, environment and the accounting implications thereof. Unfortunately, we have two wars on the go at the moment, one in Eastern Europe and one in the Middle East, and that has accounting implications. Now, we have a pretty comprehensive document which looks at all of the issues you may need to consider to the extent that your entity is either directly or indirectly impacted by these conflicts. But maybe some of the highlights that are on the slide, just to remind folks, the first is around impairments. That's probably the most obvious uh, item to think about, both from a financial instruments and non-financial perspective. Has there been indicators of an increase in um, the credit risk of counterparties? Are the uh, fair values of instruments changing as a result of those conflicts from a non non-financial perspective? Indicators of impairment. Has the entity considered both the indirect and direct consequences? and whether or not that has an impact on the recoverability of CGUs. Things like how do you build the increased uncertainty into the CGU or um, recoverability calculation in the discount rates when the cash flows. Again, we recommend using uh, incorporating that, that risk into the cash flow is probably a, a safer bet when there's higher degrees of uncertainty. Exchange rates, again, there may be sanctions which may well affect uh, exchange rates. Translation of subsidiaries, normally we use an average rate, but now you might need to do something a little bit more specific if those exchange rates are fluctuating quite significantly. And you may even be in situations where you can't get certain foreign exchange or foreign currency. Um, and there's been a recent amendment to IS-21, lack of exchangeability, which entities who are impacted by that may consider early adopting. Assets held for sale, I think the reminder there is the requirements under IFRS 5 to classify an asset or disposal group uh, as held for sale is relatively high. The threshold is high and you need to meet all the criteria to classify something as held for sale. So again, things may have changed since the first assessment and you may be further along the process of meeting all the criteria. So it may be that in the current year, things managed to get into held for sale. And similarly, if things have been classified as held for sale, you typically expect that to be um, a year or less, and then the item should be disposed of. And so again, if these items continue to be held for sale for a long period of time on the balance sheet, it's worth having a think around whether or not the criteria in IFRS 5 continue to be met. I'll save disclosures for last because it's maybe a more holistic, just level of influence over subsidiaries and associates. Again, there's been a lot of questions around whether or not entities still have control or significant influence over investments in the locations that are impacted by the wars. Again, Important to remember, IFRS 10 looks at um, the ability to uh, uh, in, exert um, power over the relevant activities. And so you really need to understand the rights and obligations that may or may not have been created by new contracts, as well as the impact of any government intervention into the entity's ability to exert influence or control. So very judgmental. I think, and that leads me on to probably the last point, which is disclosures around all of this uncertainty really is key. Again, to the extent that there is a direct or indirect impact, investors and stakeholders are really expecting the entity to explain to what extent it is considered the impact of the wars on its uh, financials, and also to the extent that it has an impact on the recognition measurements or presentation and how the entity has taken that into account. So again, I know it's some of these, you know, some of the, the wars have been going on for a while, but the accounting issues are still alive. So just do bear that in mind as you come to this end of the financial reporting period. So we have covered a lot of ground today, and we hope you found this webcast helpful. This and a lot of other additional information on the topics we have discussed with you today, you will find on Viewpoint. Thank you very much for listening for us today and happy upcoming holiday season from all of us. Thank you. Thank you.